Um, we'll look at Luke 12. It is printed for you. There are three of the Gospels that have uh, this parable that we'll look at today. The servants waiting for their master's return. So Luke 12, starting in verse 35, we'll read through the whole thing first and then we'll come back and go through it. So if you want to follow along, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward who his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying in his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and in an hour when he's not aware and he'll cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes shall be beaten with few. For every one to whom much is given from him, much will be required. And to him whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. All right. Uh, Mark and Matthew both include the thoughts in Luke. So, on the handout, let's see, first page, some notes. Uh, while the parables are similar in the three Gospels, the context of each shows them to be given separately at different times, possibly. Possibly. Matthew and Mark, uh, it's very clear this is happening in the last couple of days before Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. So, uh, he, Jesus is telling the disciples what the world will be like before his second coming. And then he throws this parable in there to illustrate it to them about how they should wait as servants for the second coming. Now in Luke, uh, the context of it is not given there at the end of Jesus' ministry. It's more given in the middle of his ministry. But there, there might be other explanations for that. Um, yeah, another thing, Luke seems to be generally spoken to the masses. Matthew and Mark was spoken to the disciples as part of a greater discussion of Jesus' second coming. Uh, so how can they be so similar? Uh, for instance, if you look back at the three side by side, you'll notice something there. Actually, Luke kind of is three separate parables combined together in a way. Uh, from verse 35 uh, through, let's see here, 35 through 40. No, 35 through 38 actually is kind of one division. Uh, if he should come in the second or third watch, blessed are those servants. 39 and 40 give us sort of a different parable, and then after 40 is a third one. Now, Mark's gospel gets the first part with, a, let's see, this is the third parable, therefore also it's make a man going to a far country, his house gave authority to his servants, command the doorkeeper to watch. Um, yeah, that's, that's like one of the three, and then Matthew's is the, a different one of the three. So what Luke may have done, and we know the way that Luke put his gospel together uh, since Luke was himself not a, a direct witness of these parables, a direct hearer, we know Luke says he put his gospel together through interviews. 
through research. He doesn't necessarily have to piece it together chronologically, uh, but he did go around and talk and gather the information and put it together in, the, in, the, uh, in his gospel. So it's possible that from Matthew and Mark, Luke compiled this, placed it at this point in his gospel, when in fact chronologically it may have happened in another time. Um, that doesn't make Luke inaccurate. Luke never claims to be completely chronological in all that he does. Uh, so it would be fine if he did that. But that may explain why Luke seems to be a conglomeration of different things and why Matthew and Mark have it at a completely different time. The other option is Jesus actually did speak this two different times. And that also wouldn't be impossible. All right, let's take a look at the first division or first parable in Luke. Starting in 35 and 36. Uh, Jesus states very clearly the point of the parable, why he's telling this. Uh, you yourselves be like men who wait for their master. So he's telling his, uh, the, the masses or the disciples this so that they are ready to meet the master. Uh, and Jesus does seem to make it clear that there will be a delay in his return. All of the parables that talk about the master going away, it always seems to imply a, a delay. Uh, a wait. Uh, and that should say something to us too. There is going to be an apparent delay in the return of Christ. People are going to start thinking he's not going to come back anymore. Uh, exactly what Jesus predicted is the situation we're in right now. Uh, Mark 34 and 35 suggests it's going to be a lot longer than people think it should be. So in Mark, like a man going to a far country, he, he's, he's gone far away. And he's giving authority to his servants, commanding them to watch. Um, and then, yeah, watch you don't know when. It could be any time he, he comes back. So it's going to be a lot longer than people think. Uh, to have one's waist girded, as he talks about in Luke, uh, means to have one's robe tied up off the ground so you're ready to work at any moment or travel without stepping on the material of your robe. To have the lamps burning suggests the hour is going to be late past the time most would expect the master to return. You're staying up late waiting for him to get back. And the wedding feast where, this, uh, where Luke is set, where the master was, an image of the heavenly kingdom, a place of celebration and fullness. We've seen this wedding image time and time again too. Another common image Jesus draws on to point to himself as the bridegroom ultimately. Verse 37 in Luke, uh, a reversal of what we would expect. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and come and serve them. It's always at the point where Jesus does the unexpected, where the, the characters in the parable do something that no character in their right mind would normally do. It's always at that point where Jesus is saying something about the gospel, very consistently. Nobody would expect a master who is gone to serve the servants when he comes back, especially if he comes back as late as, as the parables lay it out. Uh, you know, you come back from a long trip, you're exhausted, you just want to collapse. If you got servants, you know, that's the time when you want them to be serving you. But this master serves the servants when he's exhausted after a long trip. It's, it's unthinkable. Uh, it's an image of the gospel. This is what Jesus does. He serves us. Uh, in his commentary on this, uh, Professor Just at Fort Wayne writes that this is also an image of the Lord's Supper that the master serves a feast for his servants as they wait. Uh, and you know, every week our master does this for us. So a wedding image, the feast image, it's, it's marvelous Lord's Supper stuff. All right, any thoughts or comments? All right, verse 38. If he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them, blessed are those servants. On the, on the handout there, there is a division of Roman watches. In the first century, there were four watches of the night. Uh, six to nine, nine to twelve, twelve to three, um, and three to six. 
So when he says second or third watch, if he comes back and finds them waiting, blessed are those servants. So anywhere from 9 to 3 a.m., which is good news for me because I'm usually up then. So not exactly waiting for the Lord at that time of the morning, but... Now Mark, Mark mentions all four watches. If you skip over in verse 35, um, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. So there's all four listed there. Point is, he can come any time. And these are watches of the night. It's late. Again, delay. The second coming isn't going to happen when people think it is. It's going to delay a long time. All right, question. Do you think the disciples would have thought in terms of thousands of years before Christ's return? You know, Jesus was saying this to them. It, it, in our day, I, I find it really hard to think this world could go on another two, three thousand years. It is so perverse, so corrupt, so evil. It's just hard to imagine that progressing for another two thousand plus years. And I wonder if the disciples didn't kind of think the same thing. Uh, if you look up some of these verses, when the disciples talk about the end, um, I'm sure they knew it, and I'm sure they understood well what Jesus said about the delay. But you wonder, you wonder if they really thought it could be that thousands of years yet in the future. Acts 2, 14 to 17. Peter, standing up at the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your older men dream dreams. So at Pentecost, Peter quotes Joel and saying, here's the fulfillment of Joel. And Joel starts off with, in the last days. So clearly the disciples believed they were living in the last days. And they were. Uh, they were. The last days began with Christ's ascension and the sending of the Holy Spirit. That's the last days. We're in the last days. But how long those last days go is the question. Now look in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. A God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. So again, the idea of we're in the last days right now. But man, you know, could those last days persist for 4,000 years or 6,000 years or it's already gone 2,000 years? On, on the other hand, 2 Peter 3, 3 to 9 is interesting. 2 Peter 3, 3 to 9, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed, perished, being flooded with water. How far are you through nine, okay? Um, but the heavens and earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. Uh, but, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So, did the disciples understand this was going to be a really long time? Yeah, it seems quite clearly here that Peter is saying this is going to take a long time, and he even mentions thousand years. A day is like a thousand years. So they may have understood, and yet they were living each and every day like it was the last day. And, and this is kind of the point of Jesus' parable, isn't it? 
constant preparedness, looking at every day as this could actually be the last day. It has a way of shaping your life, uh, keeping you from getting careless. So did they think in terms of thousands of years? They might very well have. But they also still thought of it as the last days. Any thoughts or comments? All those people, I, when we went through the ark, we, we realized um, the, it lets you see how many people there were on this earth. Mm -hmm. how, and how evil, I mean, the evil was beyond what, you know, yeah. for that to happen, and yet there'd only be that family left. I mean, so we have, in my mind, sometimes I think we only took, we've only got the tip of it getting that. I mean, yeah. Does that make any sense? I mean, yeah, yeah. it's just, I don't from, Yeah, from the time of creation to the time of the flood was really only a couple thousand years. And from the time of the flood to the time of Christ was another couple or few thousand years. Right, well, yeah, we think the days are evil. And they're evil in a different way today than they are, than they were. And the same with Jesus in his day and age. It was a vile place to live in, first century Israel. You know, primarily because the Romans ran everything, and the Romans were just monsters. We complain about our culture of death that has our society, and it does. I mean, we do live in a culture of death, where you know, babies are murdered by the thousands every day, where kids shoot up schools, you know, people just kill each other. We live in a culture of death, but Rome was worse. Death came a whole lot easier for them. You know, gladiatorial games where they just murdered each other, where soldiers were thrown in and slaughtered in front of the people who cheered them on. You know, take care of, take, imagine gutting our prisons. This was what they did in Rome. Just take the prisoners out of the prisons, herd them into the nearest stadium, and uh, let a bunch of army guys go in there with knives and cut them up kill them in front of you and cheer while they're doing it. That was Rome. We were watching a documentary on uh, back when they lynched the uh, black people in the South. Yeah. And people would come and, and watch these people hanging from trees and stuff and they'd bring their children. Yeah. And they'd, they'd, be, they'd be like they had a picnic. Right. How can you do things like I... Uh, right. Yeah, yeah, and this, this, was, this was the world that they lived in back then, too. So we think we've got it bad. They, they had it graphically much worse. But I wonder, I wonder if the godlessness in our age isn't just as bad. It's just a different form of it. It's not as bloodthirsty and violent, but it's just as godless. Yeah. It's disguised. It is, isn't it? The, the movies... The books, I mean, the, the, the books that kids read, I don't, there's just, they're all dark and deaf and demonic and bad and gory. Oh, and they play games on their... I don't know if kids read books anymore, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's sugar-coated. It's easier to digest that way. Um, but, but clearly... It's a vile time, and it, it has been a vile time, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't go around and hang our heads and think we got it worse, because we really don't. We've got it better in a lot of ways, uh, but just, just evil. And again, in terms of signs of the end, it was just recently some wacko, just in the last couple of weeks, in fact, or the last month, some guy who predicted a date for the... Second coming, again. Just every year somebody does that. Um, I think we could look at it as a good business opportunity. If they really think Jesus is coming, they can give us all their stuff or sell us all their stuff cheaply because they're not going to need it anymore. But my brother tried that with some Jehovah Witnesses at one point who set a date and didn't work. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the point being, we, we live in an age where people think 
they can predict the end and when they are convinced the end is going to like be right here and they're looking for signs of the end. Anytime there's some big political shakeup, uh, some threat of nuclear war, a whole pile of books come out talking about the second coming and how it fulfills all these biblical prophecies. It's just utter nonsense. The fact of the matter is the disciples themselves thought they were living in the last days. All the signs necessary to be fulfilled for it to be the last days were fulfilled already by first century. We don't have to wait for any more signs to be fulfilled in order for the last days to come. We're in them. Everything is fulfilled that needs to be fulfilled. Christ could come right now, and everything was fulfilled. So, you know, ignore all those books and all those things that come out where people think these signs are now finally being fulfilled and the end is going to come. They're already fulfilled. All right, any other thoughts or comments? That's the first division. So this idea of, and it's, and it's kind of a positive parable, actually, uh, up to this point, up to verse 39. So we've got the master coming. Uh, we hear about blessed servants who are waiting well. The master gives them the feast and rewards them. Um, and now... Now in 39 and 40, it gets a little darker. The second division. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So all of a sudden now, this is a new idea interjected here. Now we hear this business about a thief coming. So Mark's kind of took care of the first part of this. This is kind of where Matthew's gospel now kicks in. So it, in fact, it's almost word for word from what Matthew says. Watch, therefore, you don't know what hour the Lord is coming, but know this, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you will also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. So word for word, Matthew and Luke agree on this part of the parable. And this is kind of a separate thing. All of a sudden now, we're introduced into a thief and a master. Who's the master of the house in this two-verse parable? And who's the thief? Thirty-nine, know this, if the master of the house had known, who's the master? Because in the first part of this, uh, wait for their master. The master was, you know, obviously Jesus. Here it's not. Who's the master? We are. We are. People waiting are. If the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, who's the thief? Jesus. Jesus makes himself the thief, breaking in. Or I suppose you could also, in some sense, see the master as the devil himself. Uh, Jesus makes himself the thief. Be ready. You don't know when the Son of Man is coming. He's coming in an hour you don't expect, just like a thief would. Uh, and it's a, it's a curious image that Jesus would liken himself to the, to the bad guy. Uh, but he does this. Uh, I think it's, again, a way of tweaking the kind of false piety and holiness of the Pharisees who thought of themselves as so godly and ran around with all these wonderful godly images of themselves. Jesus comes around and starts saying, yeah, I'm the, I'm the thief. And he was crucified with thieves, wasn't he? He was treated like one. So uh, not the first time Jesus uses this image, uh, and it is interesting how it's used elsewhere, so just take a peek at a couple of these. Uh, Matthew 12, 28 and 29 is one spot. Matthew 12, 28 and 28. If somebody else has that and wants to read it, go ahead, please. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or else how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first finds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? <laughs> he who is not with me against me, if he does not get me what he's 
All right. So here, the idea of entering a strong man's house and plundering it. Jesus is the one doing the plundering. He's the thief breaking in. More of a robbery, a strong arm robbery here. Uh, the strong man is the devil himself. Christ breaks into his house and ties him up, makes him helpless. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 to 4. First Thessalonians five two to four. Uh, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So uh, here it's the day of the Lord coming as a thief. It, the, the, thief the thing about thieves is it's, not, it, it's calculated to be at the worst possible moment a thief breaks in. They case a joint. They find your weakness. They wait for just the right time when you're completely unprepared and probably not even there, and then they break in and rob you blind. You know, th there's, there's more to that thief image than just sneakiness, uh, more than just they come at an unexpected time. They purposely come then, and it sort of, sort of suggests that God, too, is, is just going to wait for like, things to be at their absolute most unexpected, worst, where, where the world is the most vulnerable, maybe when it's denying him the most, and then, bam, he's going to come. Second Peter 3.10, if somebody has that, read it, please. Yeah, now, that's a different kind of thief. That's a thief with a flamethrower. The Lord will come as a thief in the night. Again, it's going to happen completely unexpectedly. But then we have this image in, in Peter of the earth melting with heat. So exactly what that's describing, I don't know. I, don't, I, I seriously don't think that's like a nuclear thing. It, you know, it might surprise me, but... It seems to me if there was going to be a nuclear war and that was what was going to end the world, you'd know it was coming. It's not exactly one of those thief in the knife things. There are sirens that go off, people run to their basements, um, and then the earth melts with fervent heat. But you, but you know it's coming. You can see things deteriorating. This seems to be describing something more cosmic. Completely unexpected. Uh, and also in Revelation, we have other images of, of Jesus himself again as a thief. So the, the point being uh, that there's a lot packed into this thief image that Jesus wants to draw upon to describe how the end is going to come. And that the fact that he purposely kind of picks a thief image is, is sort of shocking for himself when you have these other Pharisees running around trying to look so pious and Jesus purposely tweaking their noses. Uh, Jesus also calls himself Son of Man here in Luke, which he calls himself this everywhere. Um, why Son of Man? Why not run around calling himself Son of God? Because he was. I mean, he was Son of God. He had a right to call himself that. Identifying with our humanity. You know, not, not presenting himself as a God to be worshipped, but as... Uh, a humble servant to be killed. Uh, he makes himself in the weakness of our flesh. I mean, it's all pointing to the incarnation and how truly humiliating and self selfless it was what he did. All right, third division of the parable. Uh, and again, it's almost a completely different parable. The first one, the master coming to the house. The second parable, the, uh, the thief breaking in. And now, verse 41, something altogether different again. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? Now, in, in Matthew's gospel, 
that question is left out. Matthew does not tell us that Peter asks a question and then Jesus responds. Um, Matthew just kind of skips over that and goes to verse 42 in Luke. Uh, and the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Now all of a sudden we've got uh, another story about a, a master telling a steward to watch his house. Uh, the steward is kind of the boss. He manages the whole thing. He's not like one of the common workers. So I think Jesus is addressing the disciples here, maybe primarily but there's plenty of food for thought for, for all the rest of us, too. So let's see. On the handout, there we are. So Peter was talking, was taking this to heart, applying it to himself, and asking uh, Jesus for clarification. Jesus doesn't answer directly. Yeah, he doesn't say to Peter, yeah, I'm talking about you disciples. He just kind of goes into it. The lack of an answer may suggest Jesus is applying this to all, but especially the disciples as those who teach his word. Verse 42, the giving of food image, one used repeatedly to describe uh, the proclamation of God's word. So verse 42, uh, and the Lord said, who is a faithful and wise servant, uh, let's see, et cetera, et cetera, to give them their portion of food in due season. So he does seem to be talking about teachers there, those who feed the sheep. Uh, Later, Jesus will say to Peter, feed my sheep. So the, the food image, the feeding image, is one of teaching, presenting God's word so the people can feast on God's word. It can also be the sacrament as well, feasting on the sacrament, because we've had that sacramental image earlier with the master serving the feast to these servants. So at any rate, though, it's, it's giving God's people what they need, giving God's people God's grace. So, yeah, he may be talking about teachers there in some sense. Verse 43 and 44, the importance of faithfulness at all times, especially in the inconvenient times. So, yeah, truly I say make him ruler over all things. Uh, but if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying in his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat, drink, and get drunk, an image of mistreating others, being selfish, um, uh, indulging in the pleasures of the world to the exclusion of one's own preparedness. Uh, it's, it's just the general worldliness and selfishness that Jesus is describing that grabs hold of people. And again, very accurate uh, to the way the world is. 2 Peter 4, 1 to 5, 2 Peter, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, worth taking a peek at. Very similar thoughts. The disciples kept what Jesus taught them, you know, the, the parables and such. The disciples themselves took these lessons and taught them to others. So in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, um, we have Paul essentially picking up on on what Jesus said, even though Paul himself, you know, wasn't there to hear it all, but he learned this from the other disciples, telling Timothy these very same thoughts. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Might as well have said, feed my people. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So that's how you feed. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because of their itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. It's the same ideas Jesus talked about in the parable. Prepare God's people by feeding them because the end is going to come. You know, there's going to be a day of judgment. So the time for preparedness is now. And the way you do that, through the word. Comments? All right, verse 45 and 46 then. Uh, the worldly images. Yeah, what do, you think, what do you think is the greatest danger to pastors? If he's talking about teachers here primarily, and talking about this kind of selfishness and worldliness as, you know, beware of these things, 
What do you think a greatest danger to the souls of pastors might be? In their ministry. I've been warned by senior pastors, I think rightly so. In fact, my vicarage supervisor. Um, about the dangers of, of compliments, actually. Um, you know, my vicarage supervisor would, we were there shaking hands, people coming out of church, and somebody would say, you know, good sermon. And he, he made sure to tell me, don't listen to them. If you have a good sermon, I'll tell you it's a good sermon. They don't know what they're talking about. You know, don't get a big head just because somebody comes out and says good sermon. Uh, but there's truth to that. That, you know, something I see in, in some of my colleagues at times is a willingness to compromise in order to preserve your own popularity. And start looking at the ministry as a job that you have to preserve by compromise. Uh, compromise and seeking self-gratification uh, in the compliments of others or in outward peace is a serious danger to the pastoral office. Uh, a, a teacher of the word has to be willing to teach without getting positive feedback. Yeah. And what about the greatest danger to the souls of laymen when it comes to such things again? Well, you know, the pleasure, the pleasure seeking and the, the selfishness are just as prevalent, of course, in laymen as they are pastors, but I suppose in a slightly different world. Laymen don't have that public position to protect by compromising with everybody in order to find the the, in order to get the praise of the world, but they certainly can compromise their doctrine in their own private lives for the sake of, of getting along with others and keeping peace and self-gratification. You know, compromise is a serious problem. It, it's such a common word and a common idea to compromise. It's not a biblical idea, actually. We're supposed to live peaceably with all men. But nowhere does God ever suggest compromising anything to do with his word. Just the opposite. Preach the word. Suffer. Like the reading today that we had in the opening devotion. You know, persecuted on all sides, not crushed. Uh, pushed down, not destroyed. Christians don't compromise with the world. We speak the truth and we get beat up for it. That's what Christians do. And, uh, you know, Pastors have their, their danger of compromising with the congregation and the people in order to keep their position. Laymen have their danger of trying to compromise with the world around them to keep their jobs or to keep their friendships. Uh, it's, it's kind of just different areas, same sin. All right, so here again, avoid selfishness, avoid this worldly pleasure seeking, just be content with waiting for the master faithfully. Uh, on, the, on the handout, Jesus stresses repeatedly the idea of the end coming unexpectedly at the worst possible moment. He also speaks clearly about the decisiveness of the master's actions when he does return. The punishment is immediate, clear, and horrendous. So what happens when this master comes back and finds the unfaithful servant? Verse 46 the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and an hour he's not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him as portion with the unbelievers. Yeah, the very, very quick and decisive. Just bam. Cut him in two. Horrific. And this is an image of the judgment. Decisive, quick, final. Horrendous. And that servant who, his master, who, who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. Now, this is also interesting. It, it almost suggests uh, uh, levels of punishment. He who did not know yet committed things deserving of stripes will be beaten with few. To know and to willingly ignore right knowledge places us in all the more peril of a severe uh, 
a, a severe punishment if we choose to ignore it. In some cases, ignorance is bliss. Because if you didn't know any of this stuff in the first place and you're guilty of it, God does say you'll be punished with, with fewer stripes. You're still going to be punished, just not to the same degree as those who should know. So are there degrees of punishment, levels of hell, if you will? Um, it's, not, it's not clear biblically. The Bible never specifically talks about anything like in Dante's Inferno where you've got different levels of hell, where you've got the worst people on the lowest level of hell. But it does, in fact, talk about degrees of punishment. And what exactly that means, I don't really know. Other than there does seem to be degrees of punishment. So uh, check out uh, two places. One, James 3, 1, as one example of this. James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. Teachers receive a stricter judgment. And he's talking teachers there, pastors. Let not many of you become pastors knowing we'll receive a stricter judgment. Uh, Got to be honest, that kind of scares the liver out of me. Um, people complain sometimes about some pastors being too strict. Uh, you know, not being compromising enough. There's a reason for that. Because a loosey-goosey pastor, somebody who's been trained in the word, is going to receive a stricter judgment. The word matters. Compromising puts a, a, a pastor's soul in a greater jeopardy than your average layman. Because he has a, a, supposed to be a greater responsibility and supposed to have a greater knowledge of things. And if he chooses to uh, compromise all that for himself, yeah, there's a stricter judgment involved there. So it's kind of frightening. So that's one. The other, the other idea, uh, 2 Peter 2.20, is another mention of something similar. If somebody has that and can read it, please do so. All right. There you go. Conclusions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. There you go. So even for laymen, not just teachers, if you've escaped the pollutions of the world by, by having the faith, by knowing Jesus, and you abandon that and go back to your worldliness, your end is worse than if you'd never come to faith in the beginning. So this is serious business. The more you know, the more you're responsible for, the more you're responsible for, if you choose to ignore that, the worse your punishment will be. What exactly does that mean, the worse it's going to be? I don't know exactly. God never actually defines that. But worse. So what does this say of us as Lutherans in comparison to other denominations? We've been given the truth. We, not, we understand the gospel in a way other denominations do not. You know, we know God's word. We divide law and gospel. God has given us as a, as a, as a group so much understanding. And if we choose to ignore that, our judgment will be worse. I mean, these denominations that are doing all these ridiculous things these days, they're doing it in ignorance. They just don't know any better. Yeah. Did that mean uh, compromising? Yeah. Uh, going away from what we, at what we know as Lutherans yeah. to go easier on themselves, they compromise just to get along with everybody else. <coughs> sure. Absolutely. You know, you look at all the, the foolish worship practices in so many churches and, and shake your head. But one thing you can say is at, at least they're ignorant and don't understand what they're doing when it's another denomination doing that stuff because they never really understood the gospel in the first place in some cases, many cases. But for Lutherans to do that is all the more disgusting because they do know better. We went to a church in Illinois one time. And it was a big mega church. My daughter was in college and she wanted yeah. to go to this church. And there were seats behind where the pastor, behind the pulpit. Okay. And 
people that had done certain things during the week or the month or whatever, they got to set up. Oh, the special, special seats. To, Yes, the box seats. <laughs> There's an idea, money-making scheme. How about box seats in church? All right, we're, we're just, about, uh, just about out of time here. So just final thoughts. Uh, is this parable pr predominantly law or gospel? Well, it certainly ends on law, doesn't it? Um, to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Uh, yeah, and Matthew ends with there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So it certainly ends on law, but it's, it's still not predominantly law. It depends who the audience is. If the audience is unbelievers or those who are neglecting their faith, this parable is law. If, if it's a believer, you know, someone who's repentant, someone who's receiving Jesus' grace, who's, who's waiting faithfully, receiving the, the master's service, um, then it's gospel, because Jesus does, in fact, promise that he will serve us and save us through this. And how would the Pharisees have heard this differently than the apostles? Uh, I think they probably would have heard Jesus' parable and patted themselves on the back. Hey, we're waiting pretty well. They wouldn't have seen themselves as the unfaithful stewards. They would have seen themselves as faithful. The disciples, on the other hand, probably were humble enough to recognize their own sins. So, all right, any closing thoughts or comments there? Then let's close with prayer. Merciful Father, we pray that you do help us wait for your coming as we should. Grant us faith in these evil days. Strengthen us that we may confess you before the world and forgive us when we sin. For your sake we pray. Amen.